Tonight, cracking the case in a Canadian heist that made international headlines. The team of suspects accused of stealing millions in precious cargo. Largest gold heist in Canadian history. And new revelations about how they pulled it off. Order three. Uh, I don't think anybody saw anything like this coming. Banned for life. The losing wager that cost a Raptors player his job. No room to hold high-risk detainees. A CTV News exclusive. Like a locomotive to our communities. Plus, the right to disconnect. Taking steps to legislate work-life balance. And a Canadian coincidence in the Caribbean. Some woman just turned me around and she goes, Lynn! And I'm like, Julian! I'm proud to be an Islander. Here's the reason why. What happened when hundreds of Newfoundlanders happened to be on the same cruise ship? There's no place I would rather be than here in Newfoundland. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. Dramatic new details tonight in what police are calling the biggest gold theft in Canadian history. Revealing today it was an inside job. This story is a sensational one and one which probably uh, we jokingly say belongs in a Netflix series. These are the nine men believed to have carried out the heist at the country's largest airport exactly a year ago today. Two of them Air Canada employees. Police say a driver gained access to the precious cargo at Toronto's Pearson using a fraudulent document, a waybill, to claim the shipment arriving from Switzerland. It included 6,600 gold bars weighing about 800 pounds and worth about $20 million at the time. Also in the hall the equivalent of $2.5 million Canadian in foreign cash. CTV's Raheem Lathani on the findings, the hunt for suspects, and what happened to all that gold. What are we stealing? While it may sound like a Hollywood blockbuster movie, the largest gold heist in Canadian history was anything but fiction. And we now know the starring suspects are all from the greater Toronto area. This one is a carefully planned and well-organized group of criminals from both inside and outside of airport facilities that orchestrated this theft. Police say it was an inside job that started when this man, 25-year-old Durante King McLean of Brampton, showed up to the Air Canada cargo warehouse at Toronto's Pearson International Airport on April 17, 2023. He presented this airway bill, which was actually for a shipment of seafood that was picked up the day before the heist. But a duplicate copy was printed inside the airport by an employee. A short time later, a forklift arrived with a container of gold and foreign currency and loaded it into the rear of the suspect's truck. 6,600 gold bars weighing 400 kilograms valued at $20 million, along with an additional $2.5 million in Canadian cash, made its way west on Highway 401 before heading north of Milton. More than four months after the heist, police got a break. South of the border, King McLean was pulled over by a state trooper in Pennsylvania for a minor traffic violation. That's when they discovered 65 stolen and automatic guns. Court authorized search warrant for the vehicle led to the recovery of those firearms that were allegedly destined to be smuggled into Canada. Police in Peel region believe those guns were bought with profit from the gold heist. Their investigation also leading to the recovery of the white truck, more than $400,000, six pure gold bracelets and tools commonly used to melt gold. While King McLean is in U.S. police custody on firearms trafficking charges, Peel police have arrested these five men. One, an Air Canada employee, another, a jewelry store owner. They've also issued Canada-wide warrants for three other men, including a former Air Canada employee. But these criminals thought they were more sophisticated than police. They were wrong. To date, still only a fraction of the $20 million worth of stolen gold has been recovered. And police admit they likely won't find it all. We believe the gold has been melted down and reconstituted into local and possibly international markets. Uh, it can be done, unfortunately, fairly easy. And that's what we're trying to find out. Adding their investigation is far from complete. 
The airline Brinks still has a lawsuit pending against Air Canada, claiming it was negligent in the handling of its gold bars. The airline denies those claims, saying there was no reckless conduct. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Brampton. A decision not to play by the rules cost a Toronto Raptors player his career. Jonte Porter was handed a lifetime ban by the NBA. He's accused of manipulating his own performance and tipping off betters. Porter is the first active player or coach expelled from the league for gambling in 70 years. Here's CTV's Mike Walker. This is winning time. John Tay Porter's NBA career is over. The Raptors' backup center banned for life following a probe into gambling allegations. We don't want this for our league. Raptors president Masai Ujiri spoke about the NBA's investigation shortly before the ban was issued. My first reaction is obviously surprise because none of us, uh, I don't think anybody saw anything like this. Uh, coming. The league launched the investigation after suspicious bets were brought to its attention by licensed sports betting operators and an organization that monitors legal betting markets. The investigation found that Porter disclosed information about his own health to a sports better ahead of the Raptors' March 20th game against Sacramento. It also found that he limited his performance in one or more games for sport betting purposes and that Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games between January and March through an associate's online account. The payout for those games was more than $76,000, with net winnings of nearly $22,000. It's more transparent, so you can catch these players. This sports legal analyst says Porter's actions undermine the entire integrity of the game. Why do we go to games? Because the outcome is not predetermined or fixed. And once that's brought into question, the entire integrity of a game becomes undermined. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said in a statement, there is nothing more important than protecting the integrity of NBA competition for our fans, our teams and everyone associated with our sport, which is why John T. Porter's blatant violation of our gaming rules are being met with the most severe punishment. The league says Porter never placed bets on games he played in, fans expressing disappointment. It's pretty bad and he's purposely performing bad to make money himself when he's already making so much money. It is kind of disappointing to see though. Like it shouldn't be really happening, especially while you're a professional athlete. Mike Walker, CTV News, Toronto. And joining us now is TSN senior correspondent Rick Westhead. So the types of bets we're talking about here, Rick, are prop bets or proposition bets. How do they work? That's right. You can bet on a game, but you can also make these proposition bets, which would be on a player's performance. How many players, how many points a player might get in a game? You can bet the over or the under on that as well. It's interesting, you know, uh, in this case, now thanks to regulated gambling in Ontario, we can actually track cases like this. Who knows how many players years ago were fixing games and it just went unnoticed by the league and by regulators. In Jonte Porter's case, is there any chance of a comeback for him? Good question. We haven't heard from the NBA Players Association yet, and it'll be interesting. I wonder if it's possible that they'll argue that Jonte Porter has an illness, has an addiction problem, and that that got out of hand. And I wonder what the league would say in response to that. We've certainly seen players come back from doing horrible things off the court, off the ice, and resume their pro career later. A story we'll certainly be watching closely. Rick, thank you. Thank you. For the first time in more than a century, members of Parliament used an extraordinary power to order a private citizen to appear before the House, where they admonished him publicly and forced him to answer questions about the controversial ArriveCan contract his firm received. It comes a day after RCMP confirmed it executed a search warrant at an address registered to him. CTV's Michael Couture on the clash in the Commons. On behalf of the House of Commons... I admonish you. A private citizen hasn't been admonished by Parliament in more than a century. But MPs unanimously decided to do it after Christian Firth failed to answer questions in a parliamentary committee about the controversial ArriveCan app. GC Strategies has been at the heart of the controversy around the pandemic era application. Now, an Auditor General report pegged the costs at around $59.5 million. But Firth disputes that accounting. Has the government asked Mr. Firth to repay the money paid to GC Strategies on ArriveCan? No, they have not. While the RCMP have not launched a probe around the ArriveCan app, Mounties did execute a search warrant at this home west of Ottawa. 
The address is registered to GC Strategies. In a statement, the RCMP told CTV News, the RCMP's Sensitive and International Investigations Unit executed a search warrant, adding, as the investigation is ongoing and there have been no charges at this time, there will be no further information provided. Now, that investigation is related to Botler AI, whose co-founders raised red flags around contracting practices within the government. We encourage the RCMP to investigation uh, into the Botler allegations, whether it's fraud over 5,000, um, because we believe it's going to exonerate us. Despite suffering from mental health flare-ups, Firth fielded questions for nearly 90 minutes, which ended with this exchange. Aren't you ashamed? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, do I have to answer that? Yes. Yes, yes you do. No, I am not ashamed. The Parliamentary Committee studying the Arrive Can app will now consider Firth's testimony, and if necessary, it can recommend further action. Omar. All right, CTV's Michael Couture in Ottawa tonight. In the U.S. Capitol, Boeing's already battered reputation took another hit at two Senate committee hearings. One of the key witnesses, a whistleblower, was questioned about the safety of 787s, some flown by Canadian carriers. Air Canada has 38 in its fleet. WestJet has seven, both airlines, standing by the safety record of those planes today. CTV's Heather Wright reports. All Boeing 787 Dreamliner jets should be immediately grounded. That's the message from whistleblower Sam Salapur, who testified before members of Congress today. Effectively, they are putting out defective airplanes. Salapur is a Boeing engineer and says the 787 could fail because he claims it wasn't put together properly. He says there are tiny gaps in the fuselage that could slowly come apart. They're only the size of a hair, he says, but at 35,000 feet, that could mean the difference between life and death. I have analyzed Boeing's own data to conclude that the company is taking manufacturing shortcuts on the 787 program that may significantly reduce the airplane safety. Boeing refutes these allegations, which are not the first to be raised about the Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate, the company says. The issues raised have been subject to rigorous engineering examination under FAA oversight. Boeing has been under scrutiny for years now with concerns over its safety culture. The company is dealing with the fallout over the mid-flight blowout of a door panel on an Alaska Airlines flight in January and the 2018 and 2019 MAX 7 crashes that killed nearly 350 people. The manufacturing conditions that led to the two 737 MAX disasters also led to the Alaskan accident, blowout accident. And these conditions continue. Boeing says its quality control has been overhauled and its testing process is rigorous. But aviation expert John Graddock says there's a credibility gap and it's up to the Federal Aviation Administration to show Boeing has changed its ways. To me, they are going to be judge and jury in this one uh, to basically talk about, you know, has Boeing changed its business practices. Both WestJet and Air Canada fly the 787 Dreamliners. In separate statements today, the airlines say the planes are safe and subject to rigorous safety and maintenance programs. Heather Wright, CTV News, Washington. The verdict is in for three men accused of leading the border blockade in Coutts, Alberta, at the height of the COVID pandemic. Jurors took just three hours to find them guilty of mischief. The protest over rules and restrictions tied up cross-border traffic between Canada and the U.S. for two weeks in early 2022. The Canada Border Services Agency is rushing to retrofit new detention centres where high-risk detainees currently in provincial prisons are set to be transferred, but delays could force the agency to release the jailed migrants deemed a risk to public safety. The warnings detailed in a leaked memo obtained by CTV's Judy Trin. The Canada Border Service Agency is warning that an influx of high-risk immigration detainees soon to be transferred from provincial jails into its care may compromise its ability to keep its staff 
and the public safe. It's concerning for the Canadian public. It's concerning for our members who don't have experience working with high-risk detainees. In June, Ontario and Quebec will join seven other provinces and stop housing foreign nationals facing deportation. The union says the CBSA's three facilities in Quebec, Ontario and BC can't handle the risks. Shared living spaces have yet to be converted to secure individual cells and not enough agents have been trained to guard dangerous offenders. This is happening imminently in June and we're still very much in the early stages of preparing. A task force memo obtained by CTV News outlines contingency plans. CBSA says detention must be limited to individuals that pose the highest public safety risk, acknowledging it may result in higher rates of non-compliance. Robbery, assault, assaulting a peace officer, unlawful confinement, manslaughter. This document lists the crimes of foreign detainees. Currently, more than 40 individuals are held in provincial jails. In order to move them to CBSA facilities, nearly 200 lower-risk detainees will be assessed for release. To be in an urgent situation where dangerous people are going to be released to the public uh, in Canada, may not show up for their removal, may commit new crimes. Um, uh, this is an urgent matter. The federal budget sets aside $325 million to upgrade CBSA facilities, and the Liberal government wants to change legislation to allow immigration detainees to be housed in federal prisons. But Omar, these changes could take months to implement. All right, Judy, thank you. A fresh warning from Iran's president today. He used the country's annual military parade to warn that the, quote, tiniest invasion by Israel would bring what he called a massive and harsh response. Meanwhile, British Foreign Minister David Cameron urged Israel to use restraint in its response. Are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible. Calls Israel's prime minister brushed off. Coming up, pushing to disconnect. It's not a good way to live. The government pledged to help workers switch off. Plus, a strange stroke of luck for these Canadians in the Caribbean. Taking the time to decompress from work without guilt can be a constant challenge. Now, changes could give workers the right to ignore calls and messages once they're off the clock. Here's CTV's Paul Hollingsworth. Always being connected, available, and in constant work mode. That's not healthy. It's not a good way to live. Which is why the government wants to amend the Canada Labour Code so employers in federally regulated sectors will back off work-related communication with employees outside of scheduled hours. Similar legislation is now in place in Europe. That prevents employers from calling employees after 6 o'clock at night. According to registered psychotherapist Nigel Bone, there are obvious benefits when work-life balance is improved. Burnout will be reduced. Uh, I think that just that piece of not having to look at the phone or look at the email or feel that you know guilty or shame or that you're falling behind. The concept of disconnecting from work outside of work hours raises the question of what actually constitutes work hours. These are, are pretty blurred without a doubt. You may have a workforce that's spread across four time zones for example. How do you hold a meeting? Uh, when you have this policy in place. The cost of this program will be more than $4 million over five years. Human Resources consultant Gerald Walsh has a theory on how the money will be spent. The only thing I could literally think of was the development of the, of the policy or the law, which requires some legal advice, I'm assuming, and then the promotion of it, it through the various channels. The proposed policy to disconnect from work would benefit roughly 500,000 workers. It could be put in place later this year. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. Still ahead, a lyrical legacy. Following in the footsteps of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. We laid on Primrose Hill, did I know it still? You meant what you said. Oh, I got 
The United Arab Emirates and Oman are cleaning up after record rainfall. A year's worth of rain poured on Dubai in a single day, turning roads into rivers and disrupting travel at one of the world's busiest airports. The deluge has also been dangerous in Oman. In that country and the UAE, at least 21 people are reported to have died. Wild weather is also hitting parts of the U.S., at least 16 tornadoes ripping across multiple states. Strong winds and heavy rain pummeling towns and cities. The severe weather left a path of destruction, reducing homes and buildings to ruins. The final countdown has officially begun for the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris. In just 100 days, the City of Lights will play host to the biggest sporting event in the world. Crews are busy putting the finishing touches on competition venues as Paris prepares to welcome millions of visitors. The games begin on July 26th. And a new collaboration between Lennon and McCartney has been released, but it's not what you might expect. We laid on Primrose Hill, didn't know it's The song Primrose Hill is not from the archives of legendary Beatles John Lennon and Paul McCartney. It's from their sons, James McCartney and Sean Ono Lennon, who are following in their father's footsteps. Beautiful. After the break, cruising into a coincidence. The twist of fate bringing Newfoundlanders to the Caribbean. It's the time of year many look forward to some rest and relaxation, and it seems a number of Newfoundlanders had the same idea. 500 travelers from the province found themselves on the same cruise ship in the Caribbean. Here's CTV's Garrett Barry on the unlikely party. Singing and dancing to some signature Newfoundland tunes. It was, you would say, a time. With so many Newfoundlanders on board, staff on the Celebrity Apex threw a Newfoundland-themed party on night two of last week's cruise, featuring a local celebrity, Shanty Ganuck singer Mark Hiscock, who just happened to be there. It was supposed to be a, a delayed honeymoon for myself and my wife, so it was, it was nice and relaxing. There was, there was no pressure put on me. It all came together thanks to a travel agency in St. John's who offered a good deal for these dates. But no guests could imagine just how many Newfoundlanders would snap up the offer until about a month ago when that party was scheduled and invites revealed there were 500 on board for a meet and greet. Every time you would uh, go anywhere, especially in the elevators, you know, somebody would say, oh, what floor are you going on? You say, oh, seven. And they're like, oh, what part of Newfoundland are you from? Newfoundlanders always seem to find each other on boats and in airports, but this cruise in particular seems to have reconnected old friends. In the first night, um, we were on the dance floor at the Martini Bar, and some woman just turned me around, and she goes, Lynn! And I'm like, Julia! <laughs> so it was great. You know a Newfoundlander when you see him. And then once, they, once, once you hear him speak, well, then you go, hey, what part of the island are you from? It won't be the last of its kind. That same travel agency is booking seats for a Mediterranean cruise this September, with 100 Newfoundlanders signed up so far. Gary Barry, CTV News, St. John's. They sure know how to have fun. That's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.